A pleasant good morning, afternoon, or evening to those that are joining us today. My name is Kevin Mahal, and I'm a technical customer success manager here at TechSoup. I'll be moderating today's virtual office hour. So you all are aware we are recording this session. Those that have registered will receive a link to the recording along with a copy of the slide deck. I'm joined by a very special guest and one of TechSoup's own, Michael Enos, our Senior Director of Community and Platform. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Absolutely. Uh, before turning it over to the bulk of the presentation, um, which Michael will be speaking on, um, I'd like to address a couple of housekeeping items. Please use the chat function to type in your questions and comments. We will collect the questions and comments uh, during the session and address them during the Q&A portion. In fact, uh, as some of you have already done, and some of you may not, uh, we can begin using the chat by saying hello and writing in where you're attending this conversation from. As some of you have already heard, uh, I'm personally dialing in from Westlake, Ohio. For closed captioning, please click on the ellipsis and then turn on live captioning. Again, this session is being recorded and will be made available within 72 hours of this presentation to those who have registered to attend. A quick overview of today's topics. First, we're going to begin with an intro to SharePoint site types. We'll then be moving to Microsoft Lists before going to governance, a governance overview and considerations. Then moving on to compliance and permissions, integration with teams and site administration. And with that, I'm going to officially hand it over uh, to Michael to begin uh, breaking down some of the details uh, in the previous bullets. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, great. Well, um, thanks to every, you know, uh, thanks to everybody for joining and uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I wanted to first just introduce myself quickly um, and why I'm here um, speaking about this topic. Um, and uh, I've been with TechSoup for about eight years. And uh, prior to working at TechSoup, I worked uh, in the food security sector, uh, working with uh, Food Bank of Silicon Valley, and also worked very closely with Feeding America, um, helping uh, organizations, uh, you know, food organizations, pantries, and food banks uh, leverage technology, uh, help design um, supply chain systems um, to and, and volunteer systems and such to help improve the efficiencies of the the food security sector. Um, I did that for uh, over 10 years. And uh, I won't, before I start, I want to tell a quick story because um, I've been working with SharePoint uh, for, for since shortly after it, it, it uh, was launched in 2001. And uh, in about 2004, um, I was working with a group. We, we, we created a group called the uh, uh, Operations Technology Consortium. Which, which comprised of the technology leaders of the 10 largest food banks in the country. And uh, we were we would have meetings where we would discuss and you know how we can share and optimize our collective technologies. Uh, so then we weren't each inventing our own systems. Uh, food banking is very unique in terms of the way that you manage inventory. So um, we had spe we had a specialized uh, version of Microsoft Dynamics that we used uh, to help us track that we collectively sort of co-collaborated on the creation of. And so, and we would do that partially through this consortium that we created. And one, one, uh, one evening, uh, we were at the first consortium meeting and we discussed uh, how are we gonna collaborate with each other? And so uh, myself and the uh, technology director for the Houston Food Bank, um, who's still a close friend of mine, we went back to our hotel rooms and that evening actually brought up the OTC SharePoint site, which remains possibly still in use today. Um, and it was a, a very effective tool that we used to collaborate uh, 
amongst ourselves and other food banks. And so uh, at that time, of course, it was an on-premise system. Um, and so when I came to TechSoup, um, we were still sort of, we still have a, a lot of, most of our systems were on-premise, at least the our Microsoft uh, productivity suite. And so one of the first things I did when I came to TechSoup was uh, move us to uh, Office 365. And uh, we are now, we've now migrated a lot of our, most of our, um, a lot of our, you know, on-premise SharePoint uh, internal stuff that we do at TechSoup to uh, SharePoint Online and are just going to be launching a sort of our official sort of inter new internet very soon. But currently some of the teams are using it. So, um, and I'm involved with some of that um, work, obviously. But um, so I wanted to basically provide sort of what I've learned over the years. Um, this isn't going to be too technical, um, although I could try to address the technical questions if you have some at the end, but this is going to be more general. Um, but essentially, as, as most of you know, um, at its heart, uh, SharePoint is a web-based uh, uh, collaboration platform. And it's oftentimes used by organizations for document management and as a storage system. It's really integrated tightly within the Office suite. Uh, and it's it's tremendously configurable. Uh, there's so much you can do with it. Um, there's plugins, there's all kinds of, uh, you can change the look and feel of it. You can make it pretty much almost anything you want to, but it has this very, very rich backend architecture to, you know, that you can leverage. Um, you can, you know, it's got these, this, I'll go into some of the basic concepts, but essentially um, these are some of the things that, you know, are the capabilities um, at a very high level. Um, so, you know, so maybe Kevin, if you can advance to the next slide, I'll get into some of the details. Um, but first I wanna talk about some of the co core concepts. Um, essentially, there's sort of a, a, you know, when you, there's sort of this recently they launched what they call the modern experience in SharePoint, which is, you know, kind of a little bit more like it, it kind of pre-builds the site for you uh, very easily, which is great because it's sort of, it can jumpstart your uh, entire sort of, you know, you, you know, if you're creating a new site, um, it can kind of jumpstart that process and more immediately sort of get you access to the things that you would need for it. Um, there's a concept of a start page um, in, in this modern experience, and and this is where you could you know kind of pull in feeds, um, where you could have high level bullets and 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 um, you know as you can see here the links to direct sort of resources and also and web content that gets pulled in from. From other areas and also this is where you can very easily sort of just create a new site or create a post um and oftentimes this is sort of integrated within the context of, of what somebody would you know normally call a collaboration collaboration site like an intranet um uh, go ahead next slide um one of the one of the fundamental concepts is the idea of lists which are essentially, um, it's essentially, a, a, you can think of it as a collection of shareable data, but that data could be anything. And it could be in column form, it can be in a blog post form, it could be in a calendar form, um, it could be as contacts or issue, like uh, issue tracking form, surveys. It's essentially, you know, and by combining different types of lists, you can pretty much very readily build um, an entire, very rich, you know, portfolio of, content and feeds that that pull in from dynamic content so uh, one thing to remember about SharePoint is that it's it's very dynamic and it's meant to be dynamic meaning as data changes the site will update based on that that changed data I mean it, you can have it for preserved data you know for example like your employee handbook or things like you know recordings of things that don't change like static content but its real power is in the ability to leverage um, real-time uh, you know things that are happening for example a feed from your blog post so your your company's news events or press articles that come up you know can be triggered and then they can come in automatically um, into into a list um or announcements um things that happen so that for example you have a you know something ever changes you know the events for your week at your organization or things that are happening in the community um 
you can have these sort of automatically feed into it, into it, you know, and, and generate that, you know, content live for your audience. Um, go ahead, next page, please. <coughs> Important, a very one of the things I do at TechSoup is I oversee our so I have cybersecurity and data uh, uh, data security. And so one of the things that's very important to have you know understanding of is some basic principles of of security and governance. And these things will you know naturally apply to you know anything that you do with technology in your organization, but. For, for something like as powerful as SharePoint, it's especially um, the case because if uh, if somebody has too many, you know, too high privileges, they can, you know, un, you know, sort of mistakenly do something or if, you know, or, uh, you know, harm a production environment. So one of the things, the concepts I try to teach people or let people know about is this concept of the principle of least privilege. And so as an administrator, one of the, the, the way this rolls out is that you only want people to have the privileges and the permissions for the work that they need to do in their role. So think of it like role-based permissions. So for example, if somebody has, you know, if somebody's in marketing, you know, they should have the ability to do things they need to do for the marketing team, but not necessarily the, the same thing they would think like what the finance staff do. So you know, you, you basically have to, you want to control that so that you don't, nobody except for the main owners or administrators or the IT staff have sort of access, you know, the trained staff who understand the power of this, you know, have access to the global settings, for example, um, because they could inadvertently, for example, turn on guest access for, you know, everybody. And then, you know, next thing you know, there's all kinds of people crawling your site that you don't want to. Um, uh, another, you know, critical practice is understanding, you know, and understanding how your, your data is, uh, you know, sort of categorized. Um, sensitive data or confidential information uh, that shouldn't be shared externally um, should be in its own site unless this, you know, in, in, or in a site that is, you know, doesn't have the ability for somebody to provide guest access to an external user. Um, and you know, or, and that there's a process for that. So for example, if, you know, uh, you know, Kevin wants to add somebody to a collaboration site, there's no problem with that, except that what we don't want is maybe the, for him to have the ability to do it himself because, um, but actually have it done by uh, an IT staff who's trained because that way it's documented. And when that person does not need that access anymore, we could remove that access. Um, so these are very important, you know, sort of concepts that, that we, we, we employ. And it, um, it's, it's part of a larger sort of idea of what we call privileged access management or PAM, which is a fundamental concept in IT security. A very important other thing that Microsoft has some really powerful native security tools that can be used. For example, uh, alerts that happen when people log in from places outside, you know, that they normally would log into. So for, for example, if all of a sudden, you know, today I logged in from California or Montana and knows that, but let's say four hours later, um, it, Microsoft noticed the login from uh, China, it would, it would flag it and send an email alert to, uh, to, you know, the person who's monitoring, you know, the, the, the ad, the global admin saying, look, this is a suspicious login. Um, as well as, you know, those sorts of, you know, configure the ability to configure those types of security alerts. There's also native um, Microsoft Defender that will help scan documents and things for malicious content, malicious files um, prior to them actually, you know, in the site, crawling to the site. So for example, if somebody was to, you know, get a, a malicious document in an email and they, they just said, oh, well, I'm going to, I want to share this with my IT team so that they could look at this and I'm going to post it on SharePoint. It will flag that just like it does throughout the entire sort of ecosystem. So, uh, but oftentimes this stuff really needs to be configured. It doesn't natively, it doesn't, um, if you move on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that are, you know, other types of 
considerations. Um, the uh, SharePoint fortunately has very granular conditional access policies and also very granular permissions. Um, so you could very much sort of refine, you know, what types of things people could do within the site. I think it's one of the more complicated parts of, you know, working with SharePoint, but it's because it's it's almost so flexible and with the permission structure, it's kind of like you can kind of get lost in it. It's like, oh, I don't understand how does this going to affect my, you know, and so you have to understand the relationship between um, sort of the hierarchical nature of how things kind of cascade down in the permission structure. So this is this is important when thinking about it because you know oftentimes permissions are inherited from a parent. And so there's, you know, understanding that and spending time learning about the permission structure will go a really long ways to understanding how to best configure uh, SharePoint. Um, the other thing is, I mean, it has also these other very fine points, like, for example, um, if you want to block some secret confidential sites from unmanaged devices, meaning devices that aren't you know, haven't been, uh, aren't being scanned by Intune or haven't been provisioned using Intune or not part of your uh, domain. Uh, for example, like, you know, a mobile device or somebody's personal, you know, iPad, um, you can, you can block those types of devices from, from being on the network as well as uh, places in geographic regions. So for example, if you're not going to be doing business anywhere with anybody in say Russia, then you can just block the IP ranges in Russia and, and not worry about that. Um, or, um, and just actually very specifically, even more specifically for only work people in, in California, you can just say, I only want people, you know, and, then, and of course there's ways around that. Um, and, you know, hackers and people who are, you know, threat actors have, have found ways around this sort of geomapping, but it is, it is a good sort of first start. So uh, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, so essentially, um, in terms of the, it, one of the things that's really great about SharePoint is this sort of, is this integration, this very, very tight integration with Teams. And it's, 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 it's almost as if SharePoint is, or Teams is part of SharePoint, um, or vice versa. It's almost like they're, they're really intertwined, but um, teams leverages sort of think you can think of this way. Teams teams leverages the sort of backend infrastructure um, and schema and data storage of SharePoint. So, for example, a um, a SharePoint site essentially it is you know the, the 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 top two things are you know so for example when you create a team it's automatically creating a SharePoint site for that team. Um, they could be used independently, but they're also used, for, you know, by Teams for file storage. So you can create a site that doesn't, you know, you're not integrated with Teams, but generally the two are connected. So, for example, um, and you want that actually in a way because you want that rich collaboration through your web content, you know, collaborate web. If it's a web-based collaboration tool, having Teams integration is it is great. Um, but you can also do other things. For example, a team can have its own site where it manages collaborate, uh, you know, documents for collaboration, uh, where there's you know updates or announcements for that particular team. Um, so you can see this. There's this concept of the parent site, which is this that, that that's what's created when you create a team, um, and everybody by default as part of this team has access to that. But then there's also a site that's created on the channel level too. So that if you're just talking about a particular topic, you can create sub sites. You know, you can you can have sub sites for that. Um, so this is still that's part of that sort of hierarchical sort of approach that I was talking about in terms of the way that uh, SharePoint is structured. Um, so maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, I'm about move, moving through this too fast, but I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions and answers. So. Uh, so here, uh, as I mentioned before, this very rich sort of um, hierarchical sort of, uh, you know, way it works. This is sort of an illustration of this. Um, I have, by the way, these are what well, you see in the in the slide deck. These sort of things that are underlined. These are hyperlinks to that actual documentation 
within uh, in Microsoft. So it, when you get the stack, you say, oh, yeah, I want to go back to what Michael was talking about, about the, you know, hierarchical permission structure, um, you know, or some of those security governance policies, you can click on that link and you can go there and, and get that documentation, uh, documentation directly from Microsoft. Um, so this is this is sort of an illustration of it, but you can see that there's this item of site collection and then there's a top level, which then cascades down to subsites, which then each of the subsites then will, will con could contain these lists. Like I said, lists, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a very generic term, but I mean, that could be any type of dynamic content or even static content. Um, and it's oftentimes in very different forms, you know, like a calendar or an events page or an announcement or a survey or a form. Um, and, and that's why it's kind of said list items, you know. Um, and so those, these are the things, the list, a list is composed of list items. So that would the example for, you know, would be if the list is a calendar, the items would be the events on the calendar. Um, and the permissions kind of cascade down. So you can see here, there's a permissions for the site collection, permissions for the subsites, permissions for lists, and then permissions for list items. So for example, if you wanted just somebody to be able to not add a calendar, you know, but you wanted them to be able to add events to a calendar, you can say this person is, you know, has those sort of permissions to do so. All right, uh, move on. Next slide, please. Um, so there's, these are, you know, we often sometimes also can think of this as role-based uh, permissions, but there are uh, some default permission levels. Um, and this sort of gives you an idea, a, a, the ability to kind of quickly create, um, you know, a, you know, sort of, you, you know, you can create your own role and then, you know, with, with grand, granular permissions, but Microsoft provides the ability for you to sort of have these default permissions, um, which, and then like it says here, you can, you know, it allows you to quickly and easily provide common levels of permissions for one user or groups. Um, so, and now you can go in and see who's a member of which, you know, who, who are uh, team site visitors versus team site owners very quickly. And you can actually add people or take them away or move them around within these groups. And then their permissions as, as, as a result uh, change. And you can see that the permission levels can be things like, um, just you know, view only, um, edit, full control, like, and that would be for an owner of a site, um, and and then things where as a visitor you just want them to read because you don't want them making any edits. Um, so uh, oh, that's fine. We could we can move on to the next slide. So this is, you know, this is, you know, we're we're starting to get near sort of the, um, uh, you know, the place where this is this is a little bit more, I guess, high level. But you know, one of the really important things to do is when you're is to think thoughtfully about something. If it's going to be um, a, you know, I mean, you could use, you know, before we sort of launched, you know, at TechSoup before we embarked upon, you know, saying, well, we, we're going to build this whole internal agency um, enterprise intranet. Um, and TechSoup is a very large organization, it's international. Um, it's really good to, you know, sort of, we, we spent a lot of time, months and months, discussing planning with all the other departments and teams uh, within the organization. For example, we wanted to find out the requirements, the needs, the gaps in terms of things um, so that when we rolled it out, it would be adopted and it would be successful. And also people were engaged. If people are engaged in something um, it, it, during the planning and the process, then they're going to be, you know, super users, they're going to be engaged, they're going to be, uh, there's going to be better adoption. And also just the content won't be static. I think oftentimes one of the things that can happen with uh, an unsuccessful rollout of SharePoint is that people go through a lot of effort to build something, but they do it sort of in a black box. They launch it, people look at it, and then they it, it, the content gets stale. It never changes, and um, over time, and there isn't because there isn't really rich participation. A SharePoint, a successful SharePoint team, or because it's a collaborative platform, 
the most important thing is to encourage collaboration. And the way that, you know, the best way to do that is to bring people in, um, you know, socialize it with the departments that will foster adoption, engage key team members in the planning and design, um, and, and really work with them in the design. If you're the person who's a owner, it's, it's, this is, you know, it's so critical to the success. Um, uh, it's also important to consider, you know, who's going to own these different subsites, right? So uh, when when I worked at the food bank, what we did is we sort of had somebody who was, you know, in, in a relatively senior position in the department, but it was also uh, <clears throat> had was knowledgeable enough to be able to actually, it's not, it, you don't need a lot of technical knowledge to, to do stuff at SharePoint. It's one of the beauties of it as well, is that you're not really, you don't need to code. Um, unless you want to do something really fancy, like create API integrations or, you know, custom, you know, graphical interfaces and such, but you can bring other people in to do that, but then it's pretty much plug and play. And so if you train people who, you know, for example, any, you know, here, people in the culture department or on the finance team to, you know, this is, this is how you can update the, you know, our sort of monthly dashboard or KPIs, or, uh, this is where you can find inf resources for an employee as those things change, like as the, you know, pay calendar changes each year, they'll have the ability to do that without having to, you know, go to the IT department and say, hey, look, you know, we've got some new content resources for, for, for staff. Can you publish these for us? It's, you know, you want to give the power to the people and you want them to be engaged. Now, it it is important that the people who do that have the responsibility and also understand this sort of you know, that they're accountable for, for what they post. Um, and, you know, it, in, but most people who are within an organization who are in that sort of more of senior role will, will use good judgment um, when, when posting content and will not use it for, you know, if, if they want, you know, for example, a, you know, if you want to share something about, you know, adopting, you know, kittens from your house, you know, if, you're, if you want to develop something like that, should maybe be a separate site than the site that, that actually has your, resources for your, you know, employee handbook and such. Just, you know, some advice there in terms of making sure that the the site, the type of site, the content in the site matches sort of, you know, what you, the intent of that is. It should be intentional. Uh, and I think part of that is just, acts, you know, providing access to training resources and support channels. So if somebody does have a problem, who, you know, who do they go with? You know, maybe because you don't want to get frustrated. If they're, if they're trying to develop something in SharePoint or, or to put something together, they should have access to, you know, either support channels or to documentation and things, you know, in the training resources so that they can, you know, get what they need and, um, and, and do what they need to do. So um, at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Kevin, who's going to talk a little bit about, you know, the ways that TechSoup can help and, and also, you know, how to create, you know, sort of when what we do uh, ourselves. So take it away, Kevin. Excellent, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, and I've seen that that's come in through the uh, the chat feed as well. Um, so to the point here, it's okay to ask for help. Um, there's several options, and I, we've kind of built this out as part of the discussion flow. So beginning with requesting managed support, um, we have uh, TechSoup uh, several managed partners with whom which we work. Um, there are a couple of them um, that immediately come to mind that this is right up their wheelhouse. Um, if this is something that you look at internally and think this is, we need to have this, this needs to be part of our infrastructure, our digital infrastructure, uh, but we don't really want to jump into the deep end on this, that's definitely a situation or scenario where a managed provider would come into play. Um, whether it's something as simple as a general page setup and even a one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutorial session. Um, we have a managed partner that specifically has that product within their catalog, all the way up to a full uh, integration with containing multiple types of APIs, as Michael had mentioned, uh, all the bells and whistles. Uh, we have a partner that also works on scaling those out. Connecting with a contractor or someone who specializes in SharePoint there are a ton of people that do that. Um, there's, uh, don't want to name that may be able to scale a project for you. Uh, the access to this catalog typically has a cost. 
the product that is in our catalog provides it to you for free, along with a 20% discount to your first paid service. Uh, that would definitely be something I'd recommend at looking at um, as an alternative perhaps to manage support. And then getting into the last part here, seeking a volunteer. Again, depending on what it is uh, that you are uh, looking to do um, with SharePoint, even bringing on someone in a voluntary capacity may make sense. Uh, when I think of that, I think of resources such as Catch a Fire, uh, Volunteer Match, and Taproot Foundation are just a couple. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we necessarily have direct affiliation with those, but I know that in the past there, there's been some engagement that we've had. So if you are strapped uh, for resources, you don't really know which way to go. And these two that are mentioned are not, um, not in your wheelhouse. You, a volunteer may be uh, an excellent alternative uh, to that. So with that, uh, we're going to open up the floor uh, for q and I'm going to take a quick look uh, at the chat first. Uh, to see if we have anything that's sitting in there before just allowing individuals uh, to come off of mute and to uh, ask their questions. So it looks like um, I had a couple that were going on the same thing um, with an environment that, you know, is a little bit smaller, a smaller group of people. And again, that speaks, uh, hopefully we address that, that there are some options, a, a managed providing or even a contract service. Um, what you're looking to do will probably be smaller in scope, um, document libraries, et cetera. Um, I think that those would be a great place to start. We'll also be providing contact information uh, at the end uh, to um, uh, that you can get in contact with us and we can uh, discuss the, uh, your project a little bit further. Uh, I do have a question that's coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie, you're welcome to come off of mute if you wanted to ask it live, or otherwise I can throw it on out there. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so at my organization, we have about seven terabytes of data, and people don't like using the VPN to connect to our, uh, our file server. And management wants to move to the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they're talking about SharePoint, and I never really thought of SharePoint as like a replacement for a file server, but I guess, is that possible, or does that make sense to do that? You know, it is sort of, I mean, I think that uh, it, it can serve to that capacity, um, definitely. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily, it would, you know, generally when people think of like file servers, they have a specific sort of idea in terms of, of what that is in terms of like, for example, there's sort of this old school sort of approach to sharing where you have each department has its own file store and they manage their departments with it, but then they can, you know, just open up that, you know, that drive or, or it's like a shared drive on their system. Um, there is some capabilities for, you know, using OneDrive to that capacity um, and SharePoint to that capacity. However, you know, depending on the, the amount of data you have, it sounds like you have a tremendous amount of data. You may have to break that down into different, you know, you would have to look at the storage. I, you know, I don't, my knowledge, I don't think, you know, you can get a, a office license that would allow for, uh, what did you say, seven terabytes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are other, you know, um, other platforms that do do that, but I think that you would probably need to, you know, think about archiving or using, if all that data is really necessary to access um, or, you know, put it, you know, what's most readily accessed in, you know, in, in SharePoint and that's accessible, but then, you know, on in, in department, like for example, I take soup, you know, on our, our older SharePoint site, and we're going to be doing, we kind of are doing this in, in the new one as we're, as we're migrating, is we had, we were using it for file source. So for example, um, but it was mostly for things that were collaborative, uh, you know, documents. Um, we use, we use another system, um, a TechSoup box for things that are more permanent, more, more traditionally like a file server kind of storage. And then we use SharePoint because it's, it's more for the collaboration side for, sharing um you know things that for example you want the whole enterprise to see um, and so we do use it as a file 
as a file server, but it's not, it's not like, you know, sort of a centralized place where everybody, this is the only place where you put all your files. This is it. You know, we've sort of separated the two, you know, types of, we, we said, what kind of documents are for sort of, you know, the things that are like contracts, policies, you know, things like that, that, or, or, you know, contracts, or, you know, that's a good example, contracts, you know, contracts probably, you know, you don't need to collaborate necessarily on a contract unless you're creating a contract with somebody else. But then once it's a contract is signed in ink, you know, that's not something you would generally put in SharePoint. You could, you could put it in OneDrive um, and, and you could share it with others, you know, who, who need access to that. Um, but it might be, you know, you know, so, so there's, you have to kind of think through with the requirements of the organization. I think it can be different for a lot of, you know, depending on, those needs but yes you can you can't the simple answer is yes okay thank you that's that was in the details though as yeah well. yeah that, that's exactly what the <laughs> kind of what i what i was figuring with the since i have so much data i might might need another location for for more static storage so thank you yeah exactly yeah i pinged in some um links too also uh jamie um yeah, well, thank you yeah hasn't um applied for the Azure nonprofit grant. It's $3,500 yearly to Michael's point about archived or cold storage. Mm -hmm. It might be a temporary or even permanent solution for um, hosting some of that in the cloud. Right. We had another question here. Uh, Laura, you're welcome to come off of uh, mute if you'd like. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if um, we're kind of debating how best to create an intranet for our staff. Um, and we sort of wanted to be like, a lot of our staff aren't very um, tech savvy. So we wanted to look almost like a website um, mm -hmm. where we could have multiple tabs. So we want the front page to kind of be like the latest staff newsletter. And then we have here, you can find policies here. You can find links to commonly visited sites here. Um, Here's an archive of past meeting meeting notes, that kind of thing, but have it sort of visually look appealing um, and easy to navigate. This is this is the perfect tool for that. I mean, okay. this is exactly in some ways um, what you know in the organizations I work for. This is what the main utility was of of, of SharePoint, and it, you know, I mean, it does so many other things, but that's sort of like I think what a lot of organizations and one of the reasons is because you could really lock down the permissions to just your staff and not have it accessible to the outside world, right? People have to log in and then depending on what they log into the Microsoft account, that, that's what they see. But if you wanna provide, you know, if you need somebody like a consultant or somebody to have access to information on a site, you can, you know, but you'd usually create another site and then with, with its own permissions for that. But um, for, the, for, for your needs and your requirements, it, it sounds like this would be the perfect tool. And then is there a place where I could see sort of visual like like ideas or templates of what that could look like so that we could sort of build off that? Absolutely. And Kevin, I'm sure you could, uh, you know, send some, send some links. Uh, the There are definitely lots of demos. There's lots of content and lots of templates, actually, that are provided by, uh, you know, uh, by Microsoft to this purpose. And, you know, it, but if you, but you, you know, you are going to want to do, you may want to do some custom navigation work or something like that and all that's doable but you just do that sort of thing like once and then it's done and so people don't you know maybe you need to bring in like a consultant just to do the first sort of you know if you if you want to have a specific sort of custom navigation that you want or something that's not out of the box which is pretty rare okay uh, that's really helpful thank you yeah i just uh to that point i just threw in uh my team's uh mailbox as well as my own personal um you're welcome to send an email to me i actually in a volunteer capacity have built a couple of sharepoint communication sites mm -hmm. which which are simple out of the box and probably check a lot of the items off that you're looking to do oh, be happy great. to talk to you more about that yeah thank you i'll reach out right all right i got another question that just came in Brad, did you want to come off of mute? Or if you'd like, I could just read the question. Uh, yes, I've recently learned it's possible to have your SharePoint site uh, files uh, managed through a, uh, a personal computer's file explorer. And I was wondering, how do we how do we do that? Mm. 
Yeah, I I can't say that as far as Windows PC File Explorer, I can't say that I have a really strong knowledge of what that is. Um, I'm familiar with File Explorer, but Michael, is there any chance that you have any? Yeah, there is. Essentially, there are, um, you know, a, a location in SharePoint is essentially, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to, you know, OneDrive in the sense that if there's a document um, repository within within SharePoint, um, there is, you know, uh, the ability, from my understanding, to be able to create, you know, essentially, a, um, uh, you know, your, your, you know, File Explorer on your computer is basically just a, um, it's almost like a URL, you know, in a way. So if you're, if you have the right permissions, you, you should be able to have links directly. So it's just sort of like a link to that sort of, you know, that storage area uniquely for, without having to navigate essentially from SharePoint to that location. Um, and that is, um, we could probably, uh, you know, since, you know, throw some things in this chat or, or, you know, if you reach out, we'll, we can, we can sort of send you some links to that. But if you, you, you should be able to get that in documentation, all this stuff is pretty readily available on Microsoft, but we're happy to help if you have any issues with that. All right. Um, oh, there's somebody that's actually providing some uh, things there. Yeah, there's a, a, a... yep. Yeah, so um, Becca, um, the chat is um, closed to guests after um, a meeting or webinar uh, sh mm -hmm. shuts off, but um, some of the content that's in here, I can certainly, um, I can get that to you. Again, I dropped my email address in there. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, should have your contact information as well, but if you wanted to also do that, um, I can get this into um, a redacted form that you can reference um, at a later time. Got a question here from John. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read just for the sake of time here. Um, we currently use Dropbox for file storage and file sharing. I was not sure from Michael's answer on file share if SharePoint is a good replacement or not. Yeah, and I'm sorry to be sort of vague about that, but it really depends on the specific requirements for, you know, um, and, but generally, yes, it is, it is a good replacement. I'm just going to say that it, generally, yes, it is. Um, unless you have some very specific sort of requirements that would, you know, not make it a good one, which, which, you know, some organizations have, and that would be, um, but for most organizations, it would be a good, it is a good replacement for, for a, a file server. And, and Kevin sent some links about that. So, um, you know, and how to migrate files from a file server to, to SharePoint and how to sort of replicate the same functions. Um, but you, you know, there's some very specific types of things that other systems use do um, that, you know, it may not work well for, um, but that those are very few sort of off use cases. Right, we are uh, another uh, comment or question here from Becca, we're trying to get 365 up and running. So, okay, okay, never mind. that's not a question, my apologies. Um, mm -hmm. Becca, again, I just pinged in my email address. You're welcome to reach out to me, it can certainly help. Uh, with that, Let's see if I've got everything in here. Question. You know what? Um, just real fast though. The um, one of the things we did when we rolled out Office 365 is we turned off. We didn't want people as soon as they had Office 365 then go bonkers on you know SharePoint creating sites and stuff. So we kind of locked down some of that stuff until we had everybody rolled up, everybody in, and trained. And we had a plan. So I, I do think that's the proper order of operations because otherwise you're going to end up with lots of artifacts that you may not want, you know, and, and actually the two, your on-premise system will step on your cloud system. Um, if you're still using on-premise Active Directory, for example, things like distribution list, um, you know, if you, if you create something in Azure that could then step on something that's in Active Directory, you can end up, uh, you know, with some problems. So. Um, it's it's always a good idea to plan, and uh, if you roll something out, to think through everything before you start opening up the features because they're so vast. And by default, everything in Office 365 or Microsoft 365 is sort of open by default. So you know before you you know start inviting users to it, you need to go in there and really look at the configuration, and lock things down for the things that you don't want people to 
just play around with, you know, if you know what I mean, you know, and just go to town with and stuff. Okay, I got another question in here. Um, John, what is the best way to train staff on how to use SharePoint? That would be definitely in your purview, Michael. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think that the one of the things that we we've done is we do uh, brown bags, and so one of the things we'll be doing, for example, when we sort of uh, roll out our new internet to uh, these you know departments um, and and people to we'll be doing sort of brown bag, which is essentially um, a couple, and we'll set them up different times of the day for people in different you know time zones. And we spend an hour basically providing access to resources, going through screenshots, going through um, features and capabilities, answering questions, and then also providing and then identifying people within departments who could be subject matter experts. And you, if you if you train one person within a department, they get help support and train the others within the department too. It's a good way to outsource it if you you know if you're resource constrained. So those are, those are the things we do internally and they've been very successful. Um, there's also training documentation and, and there's things um, Microsoft provides and there's actually, you just go to YouTube and you know, it's where a lot of people get trained in everything like on how to build a deck to how to you know, configure dynamics, you know, for example, and SharePoint. So uh, you know, there's lots of freely available information out there, but to, if you want people to have a more sort of like, this is how we've configured our intranet. This is how we want, you know, these, these are the parts of it. Those are things more appropriate for an in-person training so you can show them these things and actually have them even have it on the computer and give them access and have them try it out and then answer questions if, if they run into problems. So you can kind of do these things in real time. You can create a test environment or a practice environment. That's the other thing. That's a nice thing about SharePoint is you can create a site and then throw it away afterwards because it's you can create one up for demo purposes or for training purposes and let people go to town on that. So they're not going to town on your production one. Uh, another resource that kind of sits, I think, buried in the application stack also is Microsoft Streams. Um, now, granted that you can only record up to 15 minutes of video, but I, I have filmed a lot of internal demonstrations because I'm a visual person um, to share internally mm -hmm. with how to do certain things within the 365 stack. That might be something also worth looking at, yeah. um, at least again. The, it's a 15 minute max. So are you going to have a long discussion? No, but there's probably things that you could break down into chunks and do it that way. I have another question uh, in here um, from Sebastian. A nonprofit sister organization has been holding some of our data in their SharePoint, uh, 10 gigabytes plus. Now we have established our own SharePoint and I want to move the data to its new home. Is there an easy way to transfer the data to the new SharePoint other than downloading and re-uploading in small segments? I think I might know an answer for this. If it's still available, there's a tool and yeah, there's, to correct me if I'm wrong, it's called Mover. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. You have, that's a, and I, I think that's supposed to get retired, but I don't know when, um, yeah. but I know it's at least was available as of a couple of weeks ago when um, I walked somebody through that uh, process, migrating uh, something similar from a SharePoint to a SharePoint tenant. Yeah, there are some third party tools as well um, that 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 serve to that function um, that can be configured pretty readily to do that. So you don't have to go through that, you know, download, upload sort of process. Yeah, one that comes to mind that's not a partner of ours is BitTitan, um, but mm -hmm. I know that that's a little bit pricey. So that's something right. you want to consider when you're looking for a tool. Okay, do you have anything else coming in here? All right, uh, you're very welcome. All right. Was there anything else that we wanted to kind of add here, Michael? I, I think I'm pretty good to go. I know there's a lot to unpack here for folks. Yeah, and I, you know, it's, um, there's a lot to unpack and also it's a very broad topic and so um, and there's, uh, we, we could probably do an entire, you know, presentation on just one feature in, you know, or one thing with the, within, within SharePoint. So this was sort of, uh, we hope you got sort of a large broad overview and, um, and then it, it sparked curiosity uh, to do a deep dive into any of these sort of subtopics that we discussed. All right. All right. So to that point, uh, we want you to know that you're not alone in your journey. 
uh, and that we at TechSoup do have resources to help. Uh, some of those items you can see here uh, in the presentation include the Microsoft uh, Getting Started Guide, uh, the Digital Transformation Forum, uh, as well as the Digital Skills Center training courses. Um, coming up uh, next month, this is still a TBD, so I had to just kind of put that out there as to be determined, but these virtual office hours we do do every month. On the topics do uh, vary. I know that there's some other points that we want to hit in the future that spin off of SharePoint as well, such as Power Automate, um, part of the Power Platform. Um, and we will get to those, um, but October's being worked on uh, as we speak. When we do have uh, that information, we will be getting uh, that out to you all. We also have some additional resources that are going to be included in the slide deck that you will all be receiving. Um, as far as uh, items such as scheduling a consultation with us, again, my email has been uh, added to the chat, um, so you can feel free to contact me there. Uh, we do have a uh, new platform that was built. A tremendous amount of work uh, was put into it, and they did an excellent job, uh, the Microsoft Product Recommendation Tool. So if you're just onboarding 365 uh, or you have 365, you're not really quite sure if you're in the right license type, uh, you can certainly use that. Uh, we have information on utilization requirements. So for those of you that are using uh, Business Basic uh, or Business Premium donated licenses, there is some information surrounding Microsoft requirements for that, which will be accessed through the link. We also have another amazing tool, which they spent quite a bit of time on uh, to put together. It's a digital assessment tool that goes beyond the scope of Microsoft. Um, that also ties in also to where our team and customer success comes in for technology road mapping, technology auditing, um, that is just a service that we do. You have, of course, the TechSoup uh, product cloud, our product catalog, uh, as well as a variety of additional blogs uh, to help you along the way. So with that, uh, we thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, again, whatever time zone it is, early, afternoon, late, this has been absolutely awesome. Um, Huge fan, huge, huge fan of SharePoint. Um, and having you, Michael, that was just uh, icing on the cake. Um, there's a tremendous amount of you know, work that goes into our back end. And I, I think we might've missed IT Appreciation Month um, <laughs> this past month, but you certainly, you and all the team there have my uh, appreciation. Again, for, for further follow-up, my team can be reached at customer success at techsoup.org. And with that, we thank you and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.